Hey everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and I put all of my lectures on YouTube. This is part of my course, an introduction to data analytics and geostatistics. And in this lecture, we'll carry on on the topic of sampling bias and methods to mitigate sample bias. Please watch the previous two lectures that discuss sampling bias, its source, general ideas for mitigation, and then declustering. Now we get into the idea of debiasing with secondary information. So let's introduce this idea of debiasing by showing a very simple example. Plan view again. We've got X and Y, and we're looking down at an area of interest. This dark outline is the area, or maybe it represents a volume of interest over which we're trying to make an estimate. Calculate a statistic. It could be average porosity if it's the subsurface. Then we have a location over which we say that in general, we expect things to be higher, better quality. It's a better part of the subsurface. And these are all the samples in that region. That can't be good. Then everything else will be lower values. And you notice we have no samples available, none, not a single sample. How can we make an estimate of the average porosity when we have no samples from the low part of the distribution? This is our setting for the application of spatial debiasing to address this sampling bias. Let's put a little more details around this idea. Spatial biasing. What is happening here? Well, I'll draw a distribution right here. The shaded is the declustered and the unshaded is the naive distribution. And we're changing the heights of the bars. Remember, declustering from the previous unit or lecture allowed you to weight the data, change the height of the bars, calculate the CDF, any sample statistic, anything you want to do. But the only corrective mechanism was weighting of the data. So changing the heights of the bars. What do we do when we're just missing data? In this example, we have no porosity values less than 7.5%. It's just missing. In this case, you can't weight your way out of this problem. You can't use cell-based declustering. We need another method. Dun, dun, dun. That's spatial data debiasing. All right, here, here is the idea. Now, this is an example, modified the image from the book with uh, Clayton Deutsch, appreciation to Clayton Deutsch. I believe this was his figure even from a previous paper. And so what we have here is a plan view of a reservoir. Now, this reservoir right here, it is an anticline. And so if you took a piece of paper and you bent it over like this, that's the shape of the reservoir. And what we would have is along the top here is the crest of the structure. Excuse me, I just used a piece of scrap paper to show that I've written all over that. And so imagine that structure in 3D. This is that crest, the highest, the shallowest part of the reservoir. And these parts right here are deeper part of the res parts of the reservoir. Now you'll notice our well data, but here, 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 here are only on the crest of the reservoir, the most shallowest locations in the reservoir. The problem is, is that often we have what's known as a compaction trend. That is the porosity goes smaller as we go deeper. Things become compacted, all of the void spaces get crushed up, and you just don't have as much void space. Okay, so, if we were to use these data alone in order to calculate the average porosity, we'd be biased. We would overestimate porosity. But our problem is we never sampled what we anticipate to be the lowest porosity parts of the reservoir. In other words, we never sampled the parts of the reservoir that were down on the, on the fringes on these sides that are deeper down in the subsurface. Okay, so what are we gonna do? What's the process by which we can fix this problem? What we can do is we can look at the relationship between porosity and depth. And if we have a good understanding of that relationship, and if depth is available to us at all locations in the reservoir, we can take advantage of that. Depth is now our secondary information and we'll use it exhaustively mapped 
in addition to a relationship between depth and porosity to solve the problem, to correct the distribution. That's why we call it soft data debiasing. Often it's called soft data debiasing. We'll just call it spatial debiasing or just debiasing is fine. Okay, we're going to extrapolate porosity data using the full depth distribution and the relationship between the two. Now, it's a good thing, and you might have wondered while we were doing it, why did we cover all of that marginal, conditional, joint distributions and probabilities? Because of, here's an example right here why we need that information. What we can do, okay, so let's first of all imagine what we have. We currently have only these data right here at shallow depths with high porosities. You see, this is porosity, this is depth shallow depth, high porosity. So right now, all we have is this porosity distribution right here. Okay, imagine we have many more data than I show. I've just shown these few circles here, but we'd probably have more. And so we have this distribution right here. What we want is the full porosity distribution, including the porosities we never sampled, these porosities that we missed out on. Now, what we have also is if we look at the depth distribution, it's right here. We have only sampled the shallowest depths. What can we do? First of all, we have depth available at all locations in the reservoir. That's an easy to get spatial feature. Okay, so we have it everywhere. So we know depth's real distribution. What we do next is we form a relationship between porosity and depth. Now, in this case, we'll just assume that there's some type of linear compaction curve, that whatever distribution we have of porosity at shallow depths, we can extrapolate it along a linear curve. That, uh, that's suggesting that as we go deeper and deeper, we have the same distribution. We're just shifting the mean lower. Okay, that's not a big deal. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take this conditional distribution, we'll extrapolate it in a linear manner to cover the full range of depths, and then we can use that to map across and calculate the full porosity distribution. Okay, let's give it a little more details around that. What we're gonna do for this, we've gotta map the secondary feature, which is depth at all locations. We'll have the full depth distribution. We'll develop a bivariate relationship between depth and porosity. We'll assume that it's some type of linear function. It could form, it could be any functional form. We can generate the distribution of porosity over all locations in the reservoir by combining all of the conditional distributions that have been extrapolated. We have a conditional distribution here, and we could map it down to here, map it down to here, map it down to here. You see that we have the conditional distributions over very shallow depths, kind of more deeper depths, getting very deep, and so forth. And we can go ahead and map across all of those conditional distributions to calculate this joint. We've already talked about the concepts of calculating the, the marginal distribution or the joint distribution or the conditional distribution. In this case, the operation looks like this. The marginal porosity PDF is going to be simply the integration of the conditional porosity given, see that, that right there, porosity given a certain range of depths multiplied by the actual density at that range of depths and we're going to integrate over all possible depths by doing that we actually solve for the we actually solve for the marginal porosity now, this is usually accomplished by discretization what what people will do is they'll take and they'll discretize the depth into multiple bins they'll solve for the conditional distributions in each one of those bins so right here 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 and here and maybe here and then simply apply this as a summation of the conditional multiplied by the individual marginal depth probabilities from this function in order to effectively weight all of these conditional distributions and combine them together. So this is usually done by simple discretization instead of integrating over the full distribution. Now, if you'd like an example of this approach of debiasing, 
I actually have an example in a well-documented Excel uh, sheet. And I previously mentioned this in the last lecture for declustering, but it does include a tab that actually has the biasing. So if you go to this, this link right here, this is my GitHub account. In my Excel numerical demos, there is a declustering and debiasing demo. Now I may record a video shortly that actually just works through and talks about that form of debiasing and its demonstration in Excel. All right, so I hope that this was helpful to you. This concludes the overall set of lectures on spatial bias, covered sampling bias and how do we mitigate it, declustering and now debiasing approaches. I hope this was helpful to you. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I teach and conduct research on data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. If you're working for a company and you want to partner and support student research, or you want to learn more, or you want to get some of my help, go ahead, just contact me. I've been told by some of my friends in industry that I'm one of their favorite professors. I actually pick up my phone. I'm happy to help out. All right, everyone take care, bye.